like that. This is Hannibal from TheHannibalTV.com and today is our guest here in, uh, I guess we're in the Tampa area of Florida. It's Colonel Robert Parker, also known as Robert Fuller, who most of you remember from WCW, but he was also in WWE as Tennessee Lee. And a lot of people don't know this, but uh, he also had his own promotion for a long time and grew up in a wrestling family. So before I get into it, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. I don't usually get to say in the names there. I said, Dad Gummin, I got so many names, I forget my own self sometimes. Well, you're not as bad as Brutus Beefcake. I think he holds the record for, <laughs> <laughs> for most names. But as I was saying a second ago, you grew up in a wrestling family. Uh, do you want to talk to us a little bit about uh, the history of your your family and their involvement in pr promoting wrestling? Well, my, my grandfather, Roy Welch, he owned the largest territory probably of all time before there was any cable or anything. Uh, he was uh, one of four brothers, Jack, Herb, Lester, and Roy, my grandfather. Uh, they were very popular throughout the Tennessee area and they uh, they, my grandfather, along with Nick Goulis, his partner in promotion, ran five states. Uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, some of Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, and uh, they, were, uh, they, they were considered probably the largest office in all the NWA when the NWA was together and, and uh, so forth. So, so uh, we got a very proud heritage in wrestling because of of uh, my grandfather, my dad, Buddy Fuller. Uh, he, he started wrestling uh, as Buddy Fuller because the Welch boys, uh, his grandfather, his dad and his, and his dad's brothers, didn't really want to have anybody stomp on the uh, Welch name. They thought they'd build it up so big in those five states. And so my dad took on the name of Fuller, Buddy Fuller, and he wrestled his career as Buddy Fuller and promoted many places. He was uh, one of the largest promoters. He, he was a partner in Florida, Deep South Wrestling, and he, was, uh, he owned Georgia Championship Wrestling for a long time. Uh, the same company that my brother and I ran in Alabama, the whole state of Alabama, my father started that as Gulf Coast Wrestling back in the 50s. That, uh, we got quite a background in wrestling. There's probably no other family as large as uh, as the Welch family uh, in professional uh, in professional wrestling. Did they kayfabe you when you were growing up as a young child? Uh, you thought your Did you think your dad and grandfather were literally getting yeah. beaten to pulp some nights? Yes, yes, I did. Yeah, yes, I did. And I, I and, and, as a matter of fact, I wrestled in high school and. And I was a Georgia State champion in, uh, I, uh, in high school, and and uh, you would think, having watching professional wrestling and then doing the maneuvers that you do to be an amateur wrestler and win championships, you uh, you know there's something going on here. It's a lot different, maybe too much, too different. But my father was famous for what they call hard ways. That there's hardly a guy that ever worked for my dad that didn't get his eye busted one time or another. And my dad was a real genius at it. He was a cutter. Boy, he pulled that right over the nick of that eye. And he thought he could do it easier than any way you could get blood. That dad said the easiest way to get blood is let me hit you because I just like a little stinger and I'll get you a few stitches. And, and of course, I, I had it happen to me. Uh, he and Eddie Graham had me busted open in the sportatorium when I first started working down here and, and in Griffin, Georgia. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, Luke Graham, he had Luke Graham bust my eye in a, in a Saturday night match there and so I could go back to school and show people that uh, that wrestling was real. I had seen so many hard ways in my time and I had a difficult time questioning. And I know the night that they decided they were going to smarten me up, I was in Miami and uh, and I was just graduating from school and uh, Dad knew I'd start wrestling the next year. And so he had Sputnik Monroe 
take me in the back and talk with me and Monroe talked to me for well, I guess 20 minutes trying to smarten me up and everything he's saying I'm saying yeah 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 and I go and uh, I go back out after he talks to me and talk to dad and dad says hey uh, what did Monroe say and I said ah heck I don't know he's kind of kind of just full of shit he was just saying all kinds of stuff and <laughs> dad said he went to Monroe he said I'll be darned guy you can't even smarten a dadgum kid up can you so so no I had a real difficult time accepting the fact that uh, wrestling was an awful lot of showbiz and uh, when I found out it was I was a happy man <laughs> <laughs> I guess the most recent hard way that uh, anyone has seen in this era would have been that SummerSlam where they had Brock Lesnar, I guess, give elbows to Randy Orton to to bust him up. I don't know if you ever, you probably don't follow wrestling today, but... I do. Okay. I do. I do. I, I didn't see that particular thing, but, uh, but I know that's the easiest way in the world. The elbow, that's a, it's sharp, it's nice. And, easy way to cut somebody so I'm not surprised that he used that but, but uh, uh, you know what I'm uh, I'm glad to see that today because I know in my day uh, working I I was a young kid I made a lot of money working and my deal was uh, young white meat baby face bleeding and I bled three nights a week four nights a week and so I had scars all over my head from, from being cut all to pieces but but uh, uh, you know once in a while my father would say well you know you got to once in a while you got to give something back you know you, you can cut cut and cut and cut and then it's going to be a time that you got to give something back and and there wasn't many guys that ever worked for him that could say no he had a way of asking that you just couldn't say no and uh, I know he did it to me, and I darn well couldn't say no. <laughs> <laughs> so what actually made you decide to start wrestling? Was it just something you always wanted to do? Uh, raised for it. I was pretty, pretty much raised for it. We, all, we were raised on a ranch, uh, always uh, hard work. And, uh, Dad worked us, Ron and I, and uh, he paid us very little, and he worked the living fire out of us, and we'd, we got off for from work for sports that we did in high school and so naturally we wanted to do every sport <laughs> to not have to show up after school and spend a lot of time in the field working but uh, but he wanted you to know you know a hard day's work never hurt a guy hot sun this then he'd come in in his Cadillac and he'd set up jobs and stuff and we'd work in the field and He'd jump back in, turn on his air conditioner, and head off to the wrestling to go do his thing. And I knew one day I'd like to get in that Cadillac and turn on the air conditioner and kind of do that myself. So when we got into wrestling, when I got into wrestling, I found the trips to be very easy. Uh, I, I loved the fact that the job had air conditioning and I could buy myself a Cadillac. I was lucky enough to make good money and, and, uh, and I'd haul my buddies and just I just found it to be more fun than a barrel of monkeys. Man never worked a day if he loved his job and I know boy I sure did love wrestling and I was lucky to get into it uh, to have dad that uh, kind of raised us for it and uh, tough life tough life that uh, you know he put a lot of stuff before my brother and I when we were growing up he, he made life pretty tough for us and uh, you know horses and everything else that I was a boy that I wasn't scared of anything that in growing up in my life I'd ride bulls and bucking horses and I was very good at it and uh, I didn't mind fighting <laughs> it didn't bother me a bit the guys in school knew that they knew that you know I'm not a guy to be messed with. I stayed in good shape, took care of myself, and uh, and I was proud of my name. So what was the pay like? You, you're mentioning the pay was good. Uh, what was it exactly? Not exactly, but if you give us an average and compare that to today's money, what that would be in today's money? Well, you know, I, I started in 1969, summer of 1969. I graduated from high school. And I started wrestling, and uh, my dad owned Georgia Championship Wrestling with Ray Gunkel at that particular time. And uh, I could work 
four days a week and bring home two fifty, three hundred dollars. And back then that was that was pretty good money, particularly for a young punk just starting off in the business. It paid my car bills and got me a place to live and uh, and I, I was off to the races pretty good. And then I left there, came came down to Florida to work with Eddie Graham and the folks down here and and I was working full time and so sometimes I was bringing home 500 and uh, that was pretty doggone nice too and I, I got a break then working for my grandfather Nick Goulas up in Tennessee Jerry Jarrett had just taken the book up there and and um, he had had some problems in his marriage or something his marriage broke up and he got with Eddie Marlin he's another wrestler up there his beautiful daughter and they ran off on a on a marriage vacation. He was in an angle with Tojo Yamamoto against Don and Al Green, Steve Clemens as a manager. And it was a main event. And Memphis selling out, you could make seven, eight hundred dollars in one night, uh, sometimes even more. And uh, when he left, he was, they needed a young boy to take his spot and I just happened to come in there just as he and her eloped and did their thing and, and they just threw me right into that spot with Tojo as a partner and I'd bleed every night, the greens had beat me half to death and, I'd, and I'd tag Tojo hot boy and it's chop chop double chop all he was over like nobody's business and, uh, and, and we sold out everything for uh, Goulas and Welch and um, then when Jerry came back he and I were just instant hit just like that I mean we just met the night that he came back Chattanooga and we he, he rode home with me and we had a chance to talk get to know one another and went over to my house and I got out my guitar I played guitar and we sang songs together and all the stuff we just got to be the best doggone friends that ever was and, and he uh, got interested in paying me more money than I could have ever imagined in my life that I just first week there I make like 700 and the second week there I make uh, 1200 and then before you know it I'm making 1500 and I'm just a young boy uh, in my early 20s and I don't know what to do with all the doggone money so like young boys in their early 20s I go and waste it right <laughs> <laughs> Buy too much, then you got to pay your income tax. And what was the uh, the wrestling groupies like in those days? I met. We've heard the stories about Tennessee territory being known for that, but uh, was your territory that you were from also big for the girls for the wrestling? girls? Yeah. Girls. Somebody, oh gosh, man! I'll tell you the the promoters, all promoters that hired young boys. If they if they if they pushed a young guy, and one of the things, if, if they gave you a, young, uh, a push as a young guy, and you're a good looking young guy, good suntan, go to the gym every day, work out and everything, they expect that of you. I mean, they expect you to be a, a, a guy who likes the girls, and they applaud you for it. And, um, and, and it, it helps you with getting your push. So, yeah, you know, you, you, I know I heard a little while ago Ric Flair talking about being with thousands of women. I, you know, I, I've never been with thousands of women, but, but I, I can say quite a few. And, and uh, I, I, I was kind of raised that way. My dad was like, hey, boy, you know, you don't want you to get married too quick and have all the girlfriends you can have. And he applauded me for it. He said, oh, boy, that's a beautiful girl. Oh, where'd you get this one? Nice ah, son of a gun, that one there. That, uh, it, uh, it even goes further than that. I, <laughs> I got, I, I got one, one story I tell you, you know, Jim Barnett. Of course, yeah. All right, Jim Barnett, that uh, that I worked for him, and that, that was in. I'm the, sure you got an impression of him too. In the middle, oh yeah, oh yeah, and in, in the middle of the of the seventies, um, Barnett had what he called the fart club, uh, and the boys would, young boys, especially myself and, uh, and Gerald Briscoe and Ricky Gibson, and Jimmy Golden, and, and uh, Bob Borton, all young guys. And, and uh, we'd all meet for the fart club. Do you know what that stands for? 
F an arena rat today. It was the first. <laughs> I mean, it was. Uh, I didn't say that. Oh, that didn't make a lot of people mad. But, <laughs> but that's that's the honest truth. And we and we had meetings. Uh, old, hey, Robert, is uh, Ricky effing the girls, and this is doing that, and, and, and what's Jimmy doing, and you know, don't like it. it was, uh, yeah, there were groupies. <laughs> because it kept them coming back, I guess, to the show. Yes, yes, because what what would happen? That if you're at a little Saturday night spot show over here, and uh, and you've got twenty of the prettiest dadgum girls in town, where's the boys going to go? Yeah, they're going to go buy the ticket because you say, "Heck, you've got uh, six uh, guys there that uh, the girls want to see," and uh, and then there's going to be a lot left. That's true. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you what, you put me on the spot with all that. I'm glad my wife's not here. Yeah, that'd be a little awkward. <laughs> I was talking to Luke Williams today, and he said to say hi to you, and uh, I was wondering if you have any story about him you'd like to share. Who's that? Bushwhacker Luke. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Luke. Luke. The boys, you know, when, when the boys came over, uh, Luke came over from New Zealand and uh, teamed up with Jonathan Boyd and they went to work for us in Alabama and uh, we, uh, we, we, we struggled a little bit with those guys as a team getting them over at first because Luke was so, you know, he's generally to make the faces and do the stuff and Jonathan Boyd, I don't know if you know him, but he was a strict growling tough, mean son of a gun. I mean, just, and he was that way in the ring. A little difficult to work with because he didn't like to sell a lot and he liked to lay his stuff in and stuff. And there's Luke then behind him with all the crazy stuff and the things. And, and, uh, and we just put those guys over because we needed a team. And uh, they became the best tag team that we had ever had. That uh, that the, the combination of uh, tough, mean son of a gun and the crazy New Zealand guy, and then we got the people carrying the flag around and hating New Zealand, which I don't know why anybody'd hate New Zealand. It's a beautiful place, but with these two guys, um, you'd start to hate New Zealand watching the way we used them and uh, and the good tag team that they were. And I got nothing good to say. Uh, nothing bad to say about Luke. He's uh, he's the best. Uh, and you know when they left us, uh, of course he got him another partner, which was a smart thing to do. And then here they go up to New York, and I applaud them up there every time I see them. And another tag team you started, of course, was Hulk Hogan and Brutus Beefcake. I think they started in your territory. Yes, uh, yes, they did. They what was Hulk like in those days? Hulk came in. He was green. Man, I mean, and, and like uh, like we did with a lot of big guys, we had guys like Danny Davis that uh, does a that work training guys in Vince's school and and uh, guys in our territory that we really thought were great workers. And when we'd get a big guy in like that, we'd marry him. We'd just marry the two together. We'd get an angle going between them and we'd put them together and we'd just marry them. And in Hulk's case, we'd just say, hey, there's a bear hug, use it. <laughs> and listen to Danny and uh, he'll kind of guide you the direction you need to go. That uh, Hulk was one of those guys that uh, we saw immediate money in. Uh, we had difficulty getting a good match out of him. But it didn't seem to matter. And it was, it was really crazy because in our territory, you had to be able to back up your mouth. If you go out there and make a great interview, that's fine. But then like Jerry Lawler or guys like that, you better go out there and, and follow it up with a great match. And we had a little difficulty getting that great match that we wanted, but, uh, but we never got sh cut short on the dollar figure coming in the door that the people loved Hulk and they were there for him. And after, when he came in for us, before Eddie came in, and Eddie naturally is, uh, is beefcakes, and uh, before Eddie came in, we had, uh, it was Harley worked with him in Dothan, Alabama. We had a building seat, 5,000, 
more people, but we had to go to a football stadium because we probably do, drew closer to 15,000 people with Hawk and Harley, and we'd only had Hawk in for maybe 10 weeks, uh, two and a half months. And it takes a little longer to get a guy over than that, but uh, but we, we couldn't hold the people in the building that we had. And, and then a guy like Harley can go out there and just, you know, he, he, he can work with a broomstick if he needs to. And so he'd get a, a pretty decent match out of Hulk. And uh, that's the kind of thing that we needed to kind of move him along and move him along. I, I know we sent him to Memphis in order to work with Jerry Lawler and uh, and to work with some people that we thought he'd really benefit being in the ring with because uh, then he'd come back to us being a better worker. And uh, and it, it, that, that worked for him also, that we tried to get him to work with as many good people as we possibly could, but we saw the money in the guy, didn't stay with us very long, he was off to New York because uh, that talent wasn't gonna be held back to the money that we paid in Alabama. He could make millions in New York. He's on his way. And we wished him well. Everybody that went to New York, we wished him well. Did he treat you uh, well in later years when you were both in WCW together? Uh, yes, for the most, for the most part. Uh, for the most part. You know, uh, uh, Jimmy Hart, his manager. Yeah. And uh, when, when they came into Atlanta, uh, in WCW and started their NWO and all the stuff that they, they I was hot I mean I was the hottest thing in there by far as a manager and they wanted that to change but you know what but I, I, but I saw their need for that and uh, I really was thinking it's maybe it's time for you to be thinking about another place to go because uh, they were going to make that exchange for me being hot up here and then Jimmy Hart coming along. And so, um, so you know, but I never ho ho held that against Hulk. Uh, he had a lot of authority with WCW when he came in and I, I knew that there might be some problems there. But business is business. And uh, I know from running business over the years, I'm not going to make everybody happy. And uh, there comes a time, you know, we get a five, seven year run. We're on top of our game, man. We, we have done beautiful. So we're not going to sit back and gripe about somebody else getting a push. And of course, there's the notorious story about the Rockers when they were in your territory. Can you tell us what exactly happened there? Uh, we recently interviewed Marty Gennetti, but he wasn't very specific. And he was saying it was basically Sean's fault that... Uh, you guys ended up firing them, I guess? Uh, you know what happened? Uh, and again, it's hard. I don't want to criticize uh, good people, close friends of mine, but uh, Bob, Bob Armstrong was real hot for us as Bullet Bob and at that time in, in Alabama. And he had three sons in there working, uh, Brad, uh, Steve, and, uh, and Scott. And they were all working, and and uh, and uh, they were pu they were pushing. Uh, uh, they wanted to, uh, me to push Tracy Smothers and his son Steve Armstrong, uh, very very strong, uh, the Southern boys, or so, and uh, and so that was the same time that we brought these guys in. Now I looked at the Rockers and I said, whoa. Man, we're gonna do this, and uh, I don't have any problem with it. just saying, man, this is it. We're gonna shove this team nine million miles an hour. Well, that right away got a, a bad feeling going with a real dear friend of mine, Bob Armstrong, and Bob thinking, you know, you've already got. What are you hiring these guys? What do you want these guys when you already got Steve and Tracy and the Southern boys, and you? give them a big push and they're going to draw you the money you need and all and I just said well they had been there for a while and so I just made a change and and, uh, and started pushing the Rockers really hard and um, and it, there was uh, problems it's got to be problems uh, enough 
to where uh, I told my brother, uh, Ron, that, uh, that I didn't want to really deal with it. Uh, so he said, okay. And so he, uh, I, I took a vacation and Bob Armstrong took the book to do the booking. And when he did, he fired the Rockers right there and said, okay, we're going to go with uh, Steve and, uh, and, and Tracy. And, um, and my brother just went, what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and I, you know, I'm sitting in the background there and I said, hey, I said, uh, you didn't know that was coming? I said, oh, he was like, gosh, you can't do that. You know, we can't do that. So Bob stepped back. I came back in took the book again, uh, hired him back right away. And uh, probably a month later, that dissension, that, uh, that hardship between good friends, good friends that had worked together for years and years, that, uh, that I took a stand. I said, listen, I want these boys. That's it. And then, uh, then, then New York wanted them. And so that's it's the easy answer. So now we're pushing Steve and Tracy. <laughs> but right. but, uh, but I, I saw the quality of these guys and I, I knew I knew Sean, but without a doubt, really going places. And uh, I, I wanted to be on the ground floor of that and uh, make a lot of money while doing it. So that explains when I was doing my shoot interview with Tracy, he said, he felt a lot of heat from Sean in the WWE's dressing room, and that explains probably where a lot of that heat stems from. If Sean was aware of some of the stuff going on. There, there was there was some hard feelings uh, because, like I said, I had Tracy and, and Steve living there and and starting to work with them, and then I just had a chance to get my hands on these boys, the Rockers, and. Uh, and, uh, and I said, oh, I've turned down that good talent. I'm not going to do it. We're just going to deal with this. And it wound up being one of those deals that very difficult to deal with without hardship of dear friends and people's families. You know, stuff that happens. But, you know, I've always said, you know, dadgummit, man, the bottom line is, uh, you know, we, we do what we need to do to fill up the house and to... Uh, and to choose the best talent and use them the best we can. And another talent that you managed in his early days in your territory was Cactus Jack. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Oh, good gosh. <laughs> One of my closest friends. It just, what a guy. My dad was alive. He would have loved this guy. I mean, he would have just, and I told Jack that many times. I said, man, if my dad was alive, he would absolutely love you. That here's a guy that just wanted to do a hard way every night. But, uh, I knew another guy like that, uh, uh, Fargo, Donnie Fargo. Same, same type of guy, but here comes Jack and he's the new Donnie Fargo. <laughs> And he's uh, he he's he wants to get beat up, and uh, and I I just said that's the most beautiful thing I ever saw in my life, man. Well, you know you want to bleed and you want this and you want that and we'll give it to you. I remember one night working at a tag match, me and Jimmy Golden against him and somebody I can't even remember who it was, and we got uh, uh, Japan there taking a look at him to maybe have him go to Japan. We're in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, my wife carries a kendo stick. She hits guys on the outside and I throw them out of the ring and all this stuff. And I, So he, he tells me, in the, he said, along the finish here, that uh, I'm gonna get blood. And uh, he said, you know, shoot me in and get that kendo stick and whack me back of the head coming by as hard as you can and I'm going to tie my head in the ropes. I'll take a bump over, tie my head in the ropes. And he said, and then Rob, he said, do me a favor. He says, just blister me. He said, don't hold up, don't pull up, don't do everything you got. And I say, all right. 
good deal, we'll do it. So we go down and sure enough, and we, you know, the spot comes up, boy, and I get the stick and he's selling with the blood and I shoot him in the ropes and he comes off and I smack him in the back of the head on the way by and he ties his head in the ropes, but the ropes are too tight. And he ties his head and they're strangling him. But I don't know this, all I know is what he tells me. And so boy, I just start, I, I, once in the front, boom, here, once in the top, once in the back, and then redo, and hard as I can hit him. I mean, no play and no game, just like my dad would have done it back in the old days, that I blistered him, man, just boom, bam, bam, boom, bam, bam, just over and over and over. And I see the panic on his face, and I, I think, well, I'm doing a damn good job here, blistering him good with this. I don't let up. I go ahead and I just I lay it on him. But when he comes out, and I know in Japan the story is he tore off an ear. But here that night, he tore off half of his ear, getting out of the ropes, and he got out. So when he comes downstairs, I know they come down, they tell me, they say he's torn off half his ear, they're looking for it. And the thing, so he comes down, I'm down in the dressing room, and I see him down at the other end, and here he comes. Plus, dog, down, and I'm thinking, boy, I sure did tear you up with that dead gum stick. I did, the stick started out this long, now it's this long. I tore all the pieces on him right there, and he's just grinning like a Cheshire cat. Man, he looks at me and goes, God, thank you. Oh, I'll never forget it. Thank you, thank you. And I'm just, I'm standing who dude, you know, I'm like, gosh, I never see anything like this. That I literally did my best to hurt you, and you're here just thanking me, thanking me, thanking me. That's one story. I got ten of them where I hurt him, kicked him, out off the ring apron, onto the floor, just straight off on his back when he hit the floor. I, you can hear him grunt two blocks down the street. <laughs> concrete floor whatever it is I'd go out spread out his legs stomp his guts out I mean you're talking about as a heel trying to get over working with a guy like that who gives it up and he he was making me a monster and I just said wow man I just freaking love this guy so I I wanted to take him every place that I went and any place that I went I'd say hey can you use Jack use Jack, Jack's your man, just, yeah, because uh, he was my sidekick and I hung on to him. And he and I today, we just love one another. I'm glad he feels that way because I sure got a thing for him, man. And Sid is a guy that uh, we've used in our company in Canada a lot and we've done two interviews with now. Uh, I know he started with you in your territory and it went on to WCW, but before we got into WCW, could you just Talk, talk about him and your personal territory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had Downtown Bruno. You familiar with Downtown yeah, Harvey Bruno? Harvey Whippleman. Harvey Whippleman, yeah. Downtown Bruno. He he was uh, sending me a picture, sending me pictures of him and guys, and he was up in Pittsburgh, I guess, and he wanted to come in and work for us. And I looked at the pictures, ridiculous. I'd never hire this guy. He's a little bitty twerp thing. I just, uh, you know. I, I never hire him, and uh, so I just always, you know, had sent something back. I'd say, "Hey, you find me a monster. Find me a monster. Find, find me a monster." And uh, one day he sends me the picture, him and Sid, in the Lord Humongous outfit. Boy, I look at that picture and I say, "Give him a call." <laughs> so. so so that's the start of downtown Bruno, Harvey Whitman, he comes in with Sid. Sid comes in just like Hogan, just greener than a dadgum pepper sprout. And so we got to put him with somebody good. Hey, remember there's a bear hug, y'all fight that bear hug, do this and that and that. And same thing, the son of a gun in eight, ten weeks time is selling out my houses. That uh, just the look. Uh, the look, uh, the, the action, the, the, and we're trying to get a good match. Oh my God, how are we going to get a good match out of this guy? But we're working on it, and uh, and he he makes an improvement. He makes an improvement, and he does real good. 
then we done him a favor. So now you wonder, when are you going to get the favor done back for you? What's going to happen back for you? And uh, Sid later on is the reason that I go as Colonel Parker into WCW. Yeah. And Dutch Mantel is another guy you worked with a lot in your career. Any thoughts on him? Yeah. Yeah, funny. He's a funny guy. I like riding the car with him, a ton of laughs, and a great worker. He's a guy that you don't worry about having a good match, that, uh, that he's a quality worker. He's going to get in that ring no matter who he's against. He can even get in there with a guy like Sid that's struggling with his work and have a great match with him that he's one of these guys that could do that. And, uh, and a dear old buddy. And according to the internet, you spent some time in the AWA teaming with uh, Jimmy Golden. Um, I don't recall really seeing any footage of that. Can you tell us about that? Uh, Jimmy and I, we had an ongoing run for many years with the Rock and Roll Express. And, uh, and we, uh, we had great matches with them. I mean, sensational. So uh, I made a couple of uh, uh, trips up for Vern to work with the Rock and Roll Express on bigger shows, pay-per-view stuff, things that he had that he thought he was going to do real well with, and uh, we never let him down. That uh, you put me and Jimmy Golden in the ring with uh, Ricky Morton and, and Gibson, and uh, you, you're going to have a tear down the house kind of match. And later on, that even went on into Smoky Mountain Wrestling and on, I, I mean, just, just every time that we showed up at a territory when the Rock and Roll Express were being used, they, oh, there's a natural, put those guys together that uh, we had some great matches. And how did you find Vern Gagne when you were dealing with him? Really liked him, really liked him. I, I sure did. I, you know, I, I don't know. I heard all kinds of things about him, business-wise and so forth. But uh, what a gentleman! What a great guy! And so I never worked for him an awful lot. So it's not a lot I could tell you, except just a, to me, a great guy. And Greg, his son. You know, we were in the office in WCW together. And he's also a swell guy. And you teamed with Jeff Jarrett for a while in Texas in his early days wrestling. Uh, what company was that for and what were your thoughts on him at the time? Uh, that was World Class, World Class Wrestling out of, out of Dallas. Uh, I went in for Jarrett in the late 80s when, when we, we sold our Alabama territory to a, a television conglomerate out of Montgomery, Alabama. and. Um, I went up to work for Jarrett, and and uh, and Jeff was just a young kid, and they they needed somebody to work with him that would train him. The same thing we was talking about with Hogan and with uh, and, and uh, with Sid. They need somebody to work with him, and I fell in there. I said, "Look, I don't have any problem with him being a young kid." Uh, and me being twice his size and, uh, and saying I don't have any problem with that. We're going to be fine. That uh, I don't have any problem with putting him over now and again. I, I'm not goofy about that stuff either because he was willing to give it up. He was willing he, that uh, he knew that uh, I'd, beat, I'd beat the living fire out of him. And uh, he knew it that, uh, that you know, I have to tell him Listen, I'm gonna beat you up real bad, but I ain't gonna hurt you. You know, I'm not. I'm not gonna send you to the hospital. I'm not gonna send you home with the teeth knocked out or your nose broke or nothing. But I. But. But. Besides that, that I, I'm gonna beat you up pretty good tonight. And then when you get your comeback, uh, uh, be reciprocal. I, I want you to give me the same thing back. And I don't mind if it hurts because that's part of the business that we work in and I expect that out of people when they work for me and then when I work for somebody else then I'm going to give them the same benefit that I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to beat you up and I just hope not to hurt you too bad. And what led to you guys selling your territory? Uh, tensions. Tensions. Uh, you know my brother and I uh, worked together for so many years and 
and disagreements over this or that little small things. He booked a year on, I booked a year off, with on and off. So actually, it's pretty decent thing because I would take a whole year off sometimes from the business and I'd go work here and there for somebody, but but basically go fishing. <laughs> so he did the same thing. But uh, then there was a lot of a uh, uh, question of why this year's not doing as good as that year when you were doing or I'm doing or this or that and the pressures of it. And then, uh, like I said, the problems with good friends like Bob Armstrong, he's like a brother to me. Jimmy Golden and I, we are cousins, but even there's some hard feelings there from time to time because we were all partners in that business. And, so, and it just, it was this and that and the other and the other till finally, it's just like the Beatles, you know, finally you say, hey, man, we're making a ton of money here, but I had enough. And uh, that's what happened to us. I, I was ready to, to go to work for Jared and, uh, and let somebody else run the show. Uh, just put me in the ring, give me the push that I deserve, I'll give you a great match, and I don't want all that crap that goes with it. And uh, and so I, I was ready for that continental thing to close down. And it, like I said, perfect timing for Jeff. And uh, then Jeff and I became the darndest friends, and we have such a good relationship with one another, and Jared Jarrett, and, and uh, I wouldn't have all that if I'd have just stuck around there in Continental. You got to get out and go sometime to meet people and and uh, and really see the joys of this business. What do you think about uh, the people that say Jerry Jarrett has a reputation of being a bad payoff guy? Do you I, I had the best and maybe some of the worst of that. That uh, I I told you in the early years that Jerry was proud of the payoff he would give me. He would tell me days before, you know what you're gonna make this week? And he would break all records. I mean, he had a lot of money as a young guy. Later in life, uh, when Jarrett had been in business for many, many years, I went to work for him as a booker. And um, I always insisted when I booked that you let me know the figures of the houses and I will do my own payoffs and those payoffs have to be to a strict percentage and so then if you don't give me the real number on the house then I can't get the percentage that I need to pay that strict percentage to my talent and um, I had some problems with Jarrett because of that and uh, and because of that, uh, we wound up in a short relationship. As me booking there, I probably didn't book there. Maybe maybe a year if they were at best. But um, there was some argument that uh, that uh, the way boys ought to be paid, and uh, I don't think it's any argument at all. You get a percentage. You have a house, you know what the figure is, you pay the percentage, that's that. That you don't look at it as, uh, well, the house was a sellout, and so uh, I'll turn that in $4,000 less. Uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, when we ran our business, I wouldn't tolerate that. And uh, I wouldn't work for somebody who was doing that very long. You know, I worked business long enough to be able to look at a house and tell how many people are there, how much money's there. And if I thought that uh, not only myself, but buddies that I, I thought a lot of, friends of mine, and that we were getting treated improperly, then I didn't want to stay. And, uh, and it's easy enough. You don't have to growl and grumble and scream about payoffs and different things. Just find someplace else to work. Unless it's now and there's not that many other places to work. Well, yeah, right. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, if you're working now, if you're working for Vince, they don't, whew, don't worry about the money. I mean, it's there. Yeah. I mean, goodness, it, you know, there's not that many places to work, but doggone it, 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 the money's there, you know. You know, I work with the old dirty blondes today uh, that uh, <laughs> they, they don't ever get enough money.
<laughs> you know, and, and I, 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 uh, I watch out asking them how much money they make because then I want to speak up for them. And I say, I ain't going to speak up for them. They do whatever they're going to do, they do it, you know. But I tell them, boys, when they deal with me, they're not to talk to you boys about they because they do. And, and uh, they'll tell me about a lot of shows. Hey, we can get you on this, we can get you on that. And, and I say, I don't think they can pay me. And uh, I got to stick strong and firm to them. Hey, this is what I like to make today. I'm an older fart now and I don't need all the bullshit. And so, you know, you hire me, you got to pay me. But uh, I try to give you a full day's work. And how did you end up going to WCW, uh, I guess in the early 90s is when you first came in? I was working for Smoky Mountain Wrestling uh, for four days a week. And I spent three days in Cincinnati working for my brother's hockey team. Uh, and uh, I would make most of my trips out of Cincinnati because I was working there. And then I lived in Knoxville, so it was easy to to make those trips and still be involved in my brother's hockey team and and I wasn't crazy about the hockey stuff but it was paying pretty good and uh, what and did you do for the hockey team? I, I was a marketing salesman okay yeah I, I sold space on the ice uh, signage around the things I was a, a marketing salesman and and I was really thinking about kind of easing out of the business and uh, and and go, going into the business of marketing that uh, I was thinking I might be right for that as a job and as you get getting older you know you're not going to take them bumps so much and work the ring and I always said if I can't work the ring the way I need to do then I'm not going to work anymore and so so uh, yeah so right there at that time then Sid called me and Sid asked me you want to go to uh, Atlanta with me WCW as a as a colonel We'll get you a white suit, white hat, big cigar. And you play uh, Colonel Parker, nephew of Tom Parker, uh, the guy who promotes Elvis Presley. And man, I just say, God is good. Yes. Yes, I want to do that. I don't have to work. I can go in there and be a manager, just do what I do best. It's BS. And, uh, so yes, yeah, so Sid, Sid got me that job to go in there. I, I remember the first night I went in there, uh, I, Sid's not with me. I'm just promoting him, getting him ready to come in the following week. We got some angles we're shooting and Dusty Rhodes was the booker in there then. And um, they come in and they, they give me a sheet of paper. And it's got all the stuff I'm to say, everything in the paper. And, and I read it and I go, what in the world is this crap? So I go knock on Dusty's door and, hey, hey, baby, come on in. What's the deal? You know, I say, well, Dusty, it's, it's this stuff they brought me. They want me to read this uh, uh, verbatim. Uh, you know, this is who I am. Yeah, baby, you know, everything's changed in the business today, and yeah, that's what they do. Uh, we have the writers, and the writers, and they write everything, and then you go out there and you say it. If you don't say it, then then the writers get all upset, and everybody in here, and the things don't work good. You kind of got to read that that stuff and say it like that, you know, and all I say. And I say, well, I, I'm uh, disappointed with it. And so he says, uh... He says, um, what you got? Give it to me. And so I just put the paper over there and I, I give him my interview, right straight, look him right in the face in the back dressing room. And he looks at me and he says, throw that shit in the garbage. <laughs> and so, yeah, so, so I did, put it in the garbage. And they never handed me another paper in WCW again. And I was there for seven years. Yeah. that the writers and somehow I got by that heat that you would get from the writers writing stuff and you throwing it in the garbage or either they just stopped writing my stuff so but I started doing Colonel Parker the way I wanted to do Colonel Parker and Sid had a thing in his mind he said hey we want Foghorn Leghorn Yes, sir, man, you're square as a bowling ball, boy. And we wanted that. That's what we wanted. And uh, 
and that's what we went with and and they started to really click and that deal just caught on fire and I, it was seven of the greatest years I had in all my life. Now, you know, if you say, is there a God up there? Oh boy, there's gotta be because uh, where'd Colonel Parker come from? That uh, it was just, it's who I am today. I mean, it is, I still, I'm still in the business today with Major League Wrestling and I work all these autograph shows around and, uh, and meet all the fine people and uh, man, I'm just, I'm out there as much as I want to be. And it's, it's majorly because of Colonel Parker. Were you managing Sid at the time that he had that incident with uh, Arn Anderson? Yes. Yes, I was. And uh, now, <laughs> guys that know me, they didn't laugh about this, but they laugh about it today. That when I go to work for a company and they do overseas stuff, uh, England, France, Britain, uh, 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 Germany, whatever it is, and, I, and they say, you got a passport? And I say, nope. We're going to need to get one. Nope. I said, what do you mean, no? I say, well, because I don't go. Oh, you don't go other countries? No. <laughs> and, and, and that's it. Bottom line, don't go. Don't go. So, don't go. So, so they went to France, Germany, and Britain. And they went without me. And Sid went without me. And uh, I'll just tell you the straight up truth. It wouldn't be any good if I didn't. Now, Sid was doing his steroids. Gosh, did he look good, man! I mean, he was he was lit, man. And uh, when he went, he knew that he wasn't going to be able to take his steroids along. So I, I knew that he took an awful lot of stuff on going. So the first night that they're there, he is really. He's ready to explode, and uh, now this this is what I hear, you know, it's a hearsay, but I'm sure I got the story because I was his man. Had I have been there with him, it would not have happened because I knew Sid and I knew the possibilities uh, and, and I could get ahead of the game and make sure that those things didn't happen. And I think he would back me up on that if he was here today. That, uh, but I wasn't there with him, and he was on his own. And uh, he got in a confrontation in a bar with Arn Anderson and, and Steve Austin and, uh, and uh, somebody else, I don't know who, who, what it was, but he, he wound up uh, uh, Arn, insulting Arn, and he insulted Steve. And, all the stuff and they just kind of tried to laugh it off and it went on and on and Arn threw a drink at him and uh, and the, the altercation ensued there and here come the agents and everybody and they just closed the bar they said all of the guys are to go back to the room and get out of here and it's the end of that and, and so they go back to their rooms and Arns goes in there and he's trimming up his beard and working on his beard and we get a little pair of scissors and uh, Sid goes back to his room and uh, tears up a chair. Takes the leg off the chair and goes down to Arns' room and and, uh, and Arn, Arn is trimming and he hears a knock at the door. He goes to the door, a little hole, it's Sid. And Sid says, uh, Arn, let's... Uh, Let's uh, you know. Let's go to bed on better terms tonight. That uh, you know that uh, we're on a long trip here, all of us together. You know, open up the door, shake hands. Oh, it'll be all right. So R does, and Sid, boom, it's him with the thing. Now I know you probably talked to Sid. I don't know if you got this same story <laughs> or anything uh. like it. I don't know. <laughs> this is the story that I got from my buddies, my guys that were there. And also my guy that I took over then, Steve Austin, in which he and I went up and down the road all over WCW for well over a year before he left to go to New York and do Stone Cold. So I had heard this stuff 
and that uh, then Arn take the bump back in the floor and Sid jump in on top and he needed meaning to take the leg from the chair and beat his brains out and Arn stuck the scissors in him and then uh, then Sid selling the scissors and the, the, the fight starts again and the scissors go over there and they fight over the scissors and Sid gets the scissors and Arn takes off for the elevator down the hall. He makes it to the elevator, but it's one of them deals. <laughs> oh, God, give me the elevator, give me the elevator, but, but it don't come quick enough. And Sid catches him there at the elevator and stabs him 28, 30 times with, with meaning, I think, from what I hear, to kill him. Very bad. Sid even had actually admitted that part to us that uh, he was out of control at that point. He, he, yeah, he, uh, he, he, you know, he, the steroids, they do something to you and you just don't know what you're capable of. And, um, and it was one of those deals that happened there. And I'm sure, uh, boy, I'm sure, if, uh, I bet if Sid sitting here right now, sitting next to me, he'd say, that dog, I regret that. I, I feel like he'd just be dead, dog. Just bad behavior, and nobody's supposed to have bad behavior and get away with it. It's just, and he didn't, because, you know, he came back, and I, I went to the show, you know, the first show that I made, it was here at uh, Bayfront in St. Petersburg, and and I, I, and I see uh, Dustin, Dustin Rhodes, and, and I say, hey, you, have you seen Sid? And he says, uh, what? I said, yeah. He said, yeah, oh, that no good SB. And I said, what, what is it? I didn't hear anything. I, I hadn't heard anything about it. He said, oh, you didn't hear. And he told me a story. Then I went around. I heard the deal of all the guys and everything. And then I'm standing around. And I'm thinking, does this mean I'm finished? <laughs> you know, I, I was because I had nobody to manage. I was there, but my man was fired. Boy, Eric Bischoff came to me and he said, hey, he said, uh, you're not planning on leaving. Boy, and I, I was the happiest guy you ever saw in your life. I said, no, I'm not planning on going anywhere or whatever you guys have in mind. He said, oh, man, you're on a roll. No, God tell me you're not going anywhere. And I said, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Sorry to hear about Sid, but that's life. That's the way it is. But I felt like, you know, if, if I'd have been there, that uh, I, I, I would have seen all that going down and been able to say, yeah, I said, no, let's go. We should do this. There's another bar down the street. This we'll go someplace and get away from this. And tomorrow's a new day. It will all be blown away. And uh, instead, it wound up in almost murder. So. <laughs> And That's was the business, of, man. Either of them could have actually been murdered at one point because it was Aaron that first stabbed them too. So yeah, yeah, he did. He did. He, he yeah. Uh, he, How no one got arrested? He, 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 he was fighting for his life. He, he knew that this guy has swerved me, conned me into opening up the door with intentions of beating my brains out with a stool, with a leg off a, a chair, a chair out of his room. It's a horrible situation to be in. Good gosh almighty. And with a guy as strong as Sid and uh, in good good shape as Sid, that uh, mm, I wouldn't have wanted to be on the bad end of that one. And apparently Bill Dundee was the agent and he told us he could hear it from his room but he didn't want to go out. No, no. No, <laughs> that's, not, that's, not, that's not the type of thing you want to go, go out and run into. You know, <laughs> you know me. I just gosh, I'd be sitting around there. I'd see two guys fighting like that. Whew! You know, and, and uh, I've been as the boss. I've had guys look at me and say, "What are you going to do?" You know, because I've been that sort of thing. And I, uh, I say, "Hey, boys, that's concrete you're on." <laughs> they say, "Is that all you're going to do?" I say, "Yeah." Yeah, that's it. it's not my fight. And eventually they'll blow up, get gassed, and then we'll get a couple of guys and we'll pull them apart. But right now is not a good time. <laughs> so I wouldn't want to be there for that.
Yeah, and Sid also had a lot of heat against him too because a lot of guys were jealous um, of the push he was getting, I guess. And uh, uh, yeah, because because his work wasn't quite up to par, but his ability to fill up the house, sell the tickets, they didn't have anybody better. So there you are. You, you take it as it is. You got a guy that sells the tickets, that means when your pay comes in, it's going to be higher because more people are buying, right? So I say, why don't y'all get along? Um, before I ask you about Steve Austin, there was, of course, uh, Harlem Heat's debut in WCW, which I think Sid helped Harlem Heat uh, get he, in he originally. Did. He did. Um, and that was very controversial, but it wasn't, it was kind of misunderstood because I guess they didn't explain it right. So maybe you could explain that whole situation with the Colonel bringing them. Uh, they, 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 Sid was going to bring them in as uh, Cain and Abel. And they were two guys that had been in jail. And they had just gotten out of jail. Matter of fact, they still had the prison outfits, shirts, though, and, uh, and they were going to be two boys that really had it hard, uh, Cain and Abel, straight from the Bible type of thing. And see, it had it all worked out in his head, and and he wasn't even there that night. That's that's the night that I talked to Dusty. I had this going on. I was going to manage the Harlem Heat, and I was going to introduce. Uh, Sid for the week after thing and so I had all I was there without Sid and and the deal was then Because they just got out of the chain gang that they're supposed to go out with chains around their neck and prison shirts and Stuff and now here I am in the back and a uh, colonel in a white suit white hat and a you know, cigar and oh Foghorn, leghorn, all that stuff going on. And I walk out of that curtain. Psh, here comes the smoke. Out comes these boys with the chains and stuff and me in behind them. Ah, well, here's my boss here. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh. That was in Atlanta, too, wasn't it? <laughs> Why well, we didn't get fired? Why well, we didn't get fired? They, oh, they screamed. Turner Broadcasting screamed. Oh my gosh, what in the world is that? It's slaves and a colonel. Ow, oh, we can't believe it. And, uh, and Sid was the only thing they thought so much of him that kept us all three from being fired that night. Because I just said, hey, I'm just doing what I'm told. That, but I do see the problem here. But uh, I'm not the one making up the ideas and so I'm not booking here. I don't own Alabama. I'm in Georgia working for WCW and I'm doing what I'm told. Other than reading your stinky lines. <laughs> <laughs> but that could have worked if they had done it with vignettes and some explanation as to why you had why they were in chains in the first place <laughs> well, yeah you know what it, it might have but it was just too edgy it just wasn't one of those things and now we man every time i see booker t or stevie ray what every time i see that's what hey buddy boy we just hugged we just gosh dog and that's the first thing that comes up i don't know how we made it I said, I don't know how we made it. We were fired the first night on the scene. I don't know how in the world we ever made it, but again, there's a God up there and he's watching over us. He, he took care of us and we still got our job. Here you come, Harlem Heat and Sherry and oh, good Lord and mercy, all the good stuff that happened to them and, and happened to me that uh, just a good deal. And I forgot to ask you about uh, the point in time where you were co-managing Sid and Vader with uh, Harley Race. What was that like working with Vader and Race? Uh, you know what? I got I got along real good with Vader. Uh, uh, for some reason or another, he just really liked me. And uh, and and Harley, my goodness, Harley, Harley's like my daddy. It, you know, I just I love Harley like a like a brother, a father, or whatever you want to call it. it and uh, I have so much respect for him. And when they threw me into that deal, uh, I just said, "Good Lord, this is just this too good to be true." 
and we went to do the beach blast and we went over to the beach to do the big spot there where we confronted Sting and David Boy out there with the kids. The funniest thing, we confront them there, they're playing volleyball and David Boy and Sting playing volleyball with a bunch of kids. Yeah. And uh, I'm working for Major League Wrestling back in Miami just a short time ago and here comes Davy Boy's boy in and he tells, tells me, he says, uh, you, you remember when you did that thing on the beach back in the, yeah, I said, oh yeah, he said, I was a little bitty boy but <laughs> playing volleyball. <laughs> it's like, gosh, Marty, you know, now he's a great big dad gum kid. I don't mm. know if you know, he works his. Oh yeah, he wrestles yeah. for our company sometimes. Yeah, 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 Davey Boy's boy, he's a great guy. He's yeah. a really good kid, but he's reminding me how old I am. And I'm saying, oh, well, that dog, you were one of the kids out there playing, were you? Yeah, I was one of those kids. No, I, I love those guys, and I loved uh, working with, uh, with them. I know a lot of guys didn't like working with Vader an awful lot. But, uh, and uh, you know, and then some people got hurt, and he was an awful rough son of a gun. But, uh, but for some reason or other, I guess because old timer, he just said, ah, I kind of like old Rob, and so we got along well. And did you ever witness any uh, incidents where Harley Race had to show uh, his toughness in a fan attack or anything like that, any type of confrontation outside the room? You know what, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. Uh, not with Harley. Uh, uh, some guys. But uh, not with Harley. But I, I wouldn't want to be on the bad end of that because uh, Harley was, gosh, dog, he just... He could just reach over and just grab your leg above your knee, you know, just grip and stuff, and just get, hey, how you doing, man? Gosh, dog, you just say, good Lord, you broke my leg. <laughs> you know, and it's just playing around. That, uh, that Harley was, a, he's a lot tougher than what he looked. That uh, Harley was strong and tough, and yeah, I wouldn't want to be on the bad end of messing with him. And he usually carried guns too, from what I understand. So yeah, may well have, yeah. may well have. Yeah, I don't think he needed it. No. <laughs> and you mentioned uh, your time with Steve Austin. Could you go into some more detail on that? And uh, if you could have seen how big a star he was going to be at all in those days. Oh gosh, uh, Steve and I worked together probably a year and a half before he went to New York in Atlanta. And at the time that I was working with him, I was working in the office as an agent. And it was Bill Dundee, Greg Gagne, Mike Graham, uh, Tony Schiavone, me, uh, uh, that we, uh, we were taking care of business. And so when I heard that Steve was leaving, Steve told me, you know, wait to Augusta one night in the car that I, I'm going to be going to New York. And I'm a win. Man, what is that? And he says, oh, gosh, pretty soon. I God, talk. So I have this old time to talk with him. And I say, well, you're making, what are you making? A quarter mil, 250,000? Got a year on your contract? God, you know, burning bridges? bad deal son burning bridges you know I said you you burn a bridge you can't go back and an old man's story I'm giving him all the stuff you might ought to do your year and go ahead and make you 250 and that's good money and uh, and and hang it out and then go on up to New York you know and I didn't want him to leave me either because well, I, yeah he, he and I were good together there we are man rock and roll <laughs> that uh, I thought a lot of him. Uh, then he left, and uh, then 98, years after that, I went up, went up to do Tennessee Lee for him, and we're sitting in the dressing room, and he's sitting over there, and, and I know, you know, that year he made, he made 14 million or something in the year uh, with all of his stuff, and really, tearing the world apart and he look over there and he said he said hey boys he said oh colonel now he said now that he said you won't get a better manager better performer right there but he said 
Don't let him be handling your business a lot. And I just get a big crack out of it. I find it very funny. But but I say, man, you're exactly right. You don't want me telling you not to burn bridges when you're making 250 grand. You got a chance to go make 14 million. I'm not hardly the colonel that ought to be uh, running your business. <laughs> And of course, uh, a lot of people remember you as being Ming's manager, and uh, he's a very popular topic on this channel. Do you have any stories about Ming? Yeah, yeah, I do. I got, I got a lot of them. Uh, one of them, I'll tell you, a funny one. I'm, I'm working in war games, and I'm on the outside of the cage, and they got Dusty and the Nasty Boys in the ring, and and, and I've got. Jim, I got Buck and, and my, my three guys, I forget who they were, but if they all get beat, my guys, then I have to enter the cage. That's the deal, and then I have to wrestle. Well, uh, me and me on the outside, and I got my Colonel White suit on, and I'm marching up and down, and they beat one of my boys, and he has to leave, and they beat one of my boys, and he has to leave the cage, and, and I realized, oh my Lord, there's three against one. I'm in serious, serious trouble here. I'm gonna have to go in and wrestle, and so I'm selling this to the people, and I go over, and I, I sit down on the, steps going into the ring my white outfit let me kind of sweaty from back and forth from working and uh, when I get up uh, somebody says in the crowd behind me says hey he crapped his pants well I knew what that was I, I knew I, I, I sat on that dirty step with my white suit on <laughs> so you know so, so, I, so I knew that I knew it but then uh Sure enough, they, they beat the last guy, and now I gotta go in, and oh, and I'm dying, I'm crying, so the nasty boys shoot me in, and, and bang, and they double team me, and they drop elbows on me like crazy, and Dusty puts the figure four on me, and, and that's hurting because I'm trying to sit up, take the pressure off my legs, and, and the nasty boys are just pounding me with elbows, one and the other, as fast as they can get up, and the other one hit me, the other one hit me. Other. Well, Ming is on the outside, and he's like a wild gorilla. He's on that cage, and the whole cage is shaking. Wow, 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 wow. He's mad. He's mad. He's like, you guys are too much. You know, you're hurting, Colonel. And he just loved me, and I love him too. And he, it's, and, uh, and they beat me in the deal, and they, they leave. And Ming comes running in. He gets you into the cage and he get, comes over and I'm laying there and I'm selling like crazy. And I had the crab beat out of me. And he gets it back of my head and he picks me up and he and he and his face is right there, just that close to mine. It's almost kissing. But we can almost kiss. He's so close and he's and he's almost in tears. And he's so emotional and he says, Colonel. Are you okay? He says to me with the eyes like that. And I look at him and I say, No, man. I shit my pants. <laughs> with the eyes right close, he cracks up laughing. You know, he cracks. I tell you, you're killing the freaking business here, son. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be laughing. You're supposed to be emotional. Go back to the other guy that you were. Uh, but that's just the way he is. He's like, you <laughs> need to laugh because it was just eye to eye that close. It's like you shouldn't get that close to my face, brother. You know, because I got then I laid that line on him. I shit my pants. <laughs> he just cracked up. Then he went back in the dressing room. The deal was. We were supposed to go back, find their dressing room, and Ming was going to go inside, and he was going to kick the crap out of all, all three of them. They were all in there together. And so he did. Every one of them came out bleeding. Every single one of them. I mean, brutal. Blah, blah. Blah, blah. It's not just a bunch of noise. They went in with the cameras and the thing. He tore that place apart and, and all of them came out bleeding. And I watched that and I said, Damn.
damn that guy. <laughs> Man, you wouldn't want to be on his bad side. I said, good Lord, did he kick the living fire out of them. That said, that, uh, that uh, mean was something else, man. Got in trouble in a bar with him one night, I have to tell you real quick, and he grabbed guy's throat, wouldn't let go, choked him out. And Ric Flair said, get him out, get him out, get him out. So so me and Pittman, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Sergeant Pittman, the bulldog, we start off down the street and we got Ming and he's been drinking Jack Daniels and he don't, he, he don't drink, but this night he's drinking it. And uh, here comes the cops, cars all around us, and surround. we didn't get to the car. And as uh, and soon as they get out of the car, and the cop comes over, and he says, your hands behind your back. And Ming says, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, won't do it, I'm not going to do it. My hands don't go behind my back, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. And the cop saying, you, get your hands behind your back, and then Pittman screams out, man says no cops, like that, loud. And I say, oh, crap, we're all going to get shot. <laughs> I guess I'm going to find to get Pittman. Stay back, a big thing. And I'll talk to the cop and say, listen, you do something where you don't have to do that because his hands won't go behind his back to put handcuffs on. He's too big. And uh, oh, and the cop is one of these guys that he listens. And I'm telling Pitt Bulldog, please, don't say any more. Uh, you know, well, let me handle this and, uh, where we don't all get shot here tonight because of these guys see the danger in you two guys and I'm standing in the middle, poor Rob. <laughs> there, there you are. So, I mean, he's, he could be volatile and he, boy, he could be, but the nicest son of a gun, I spent three years going down the road with him, best three years I've ever had in my life. Yeah. And the set stable feuded a lot with uh, Terry Funk, off and on. Any stories about Terry Funk? Oh, man, you could go all night talking about Terry. That uh, I had the best match I ever had in my life with Terry. That's that, that's one that I can that I can easily tell you that uh, we we had a match in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. My we were pushing my brother t to work with. Um, I guess it was Dory at that time and uh, and we had Terry we had three former world champions uh, in the tournament and, uh, and I had uh, I had drawn Terry for the tournament and so I'm so I go out and make my interview on TV and I say I'm gonna tell you something I'm, I, I may you know I'm, I may not be the world champion my, my brother's probably the man to, to, to work for this world to be the world champion contender. But I'm going to see Terry Funk gets taken out. I'm going to see to it. It's the last thing I ever do. I promise my brother, God above, that I'll take Terry Funk out so my brother doesn't have to come back and beat him in order to get there. That it's the only thing I got to do. I'm going to do it. And uh, so I go out. We, boy, me and him, me and Terry, we, we go. Time limit draw. It's got to be a winner. So five more minutes. I am gassed. I mean, to the thing. So the finish on the thing, he's going to take me, put me in a Boston Crab near the corner. And, uh, and he's going to lean his head forward as the referee's asking me, do I give up? Do I give up? He leans his head forward into the corner to get extra leverage. It's the picture that we're painting. And uh, and so I fight and I fight and I fight, but when he gets that extra leverage and think, I gotta give up. So he not only beats me, and I don't do what I said I'd do, God above, I'll take him out, I'll get, but he beats me with a submission, I give up. I'm gassed. I lay in the ring on my back, and I think I'm having a heart attack. I can't get up. I don't. I don't have any energy left to, to get up. I gave it all, everything, and that Boston Crab. After all of that, it just gassed me so bad. I just. I, yeah. I was, and that's very painful, like for fans I, that have given one. I, 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 was, I was. I was near death. I yeah. felt like I was near death. And my brother's standing back in the back, and he sees, 
And we all have this planned. He sees it. He looks at it. He says, oh, he's having a heart attack. So he comes down to the ring, placed quiet. You can drop a pin. And I'm laying there. And Ron comes in and he looks at me. He says, you all right? And I say, I don't know. I don't know. And he said, he said uh, what's wrong with you? Is your heart? I said, I don't know. I, I, can't, uh, I can't get up. So he says, ah, come on. He reaches behind my back and sets, sets me up. Sets me up. And I say, I don't have any energy. I can't stand. So him and the referee, they get me. And they, they pick me up. And uh, I get to my feet. The friggin' place goes crazy. And I realized something. You know, it's something that you take to book, you take to own the territory, to book, that you ain't got to win to get over. You don't have to win. That those people in that crowd sold out house that night in Knoxville's Civic Center. And they all, in their hearts, I was the hero of the night. I was the best thing there was all night long. That they were, every single one, joined to me like we were all one. And I felt it. And I looked around and I saw it. And I said, this is the best night I've ever had in the ring. I gave up a, a, a hope in the middle of the ring, and it's the best thing I ever did in this business because of the way we are in contact, me and these people. And my brother, he took me out of there. And uh, so I look at Terry Funk, and I say, boy, whew, you drill me, man, but we worked frigging hard. And if you weren't in shape, you couldn't work like that. He couldn't do it, and we beat the coal hell out of one another. And uh, I love Terry for it. That's the kind of guy he is, and you're going to earn your money when you work with Terry. It's the way it is. It's the way it is. And one of the moments you're most remember or uh, remembered for in WCW is, is, of course, your marriage to Sensational Sherry. Uh, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. What a girl. Gosh, dog. What a girl. Oh, goodness gracious. We never dated. We weren't lovers. Never spent any time together romantically. Uh, she might have uh, preferred that it would have been that way. A little bit. We lived at La Park, the same kind of, uh, same uh, apartment complex in Marietta. And uh, we were close. She'd come over and she'd visit me at my place. I'd always... Crown roll. I get it and put it away. So she'd get that glass and pour it up thing. And I was on the seventh floor. So she'd go out and sit on the banister, seven floors down, drink that down. Say, Sherry, don't sit up there, honey. Oh, you leave me alone. Oh, oh gosh. It's a, it's a, you can't do nothing with her. She's her own girl. Uh, the, the, the night that we uh, did the marriage, the, the night that we did the marriage, uh, we're waiting on her. She don't show up. She don't show up. She don't show up. And they're saying, we may have to call this thing. No, 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 she'll be here. She, so she shows up, and she's three shits in the wind. I mean, she's gone. And the, the, the production people say, we can't do it. We can't do it. We can't do it. And she's there. Ah! I'm gonna do that thing. I'm so, so 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 I tell them I get the good because we've been waiting all this time and I tell the production guys I say hey guys this is better it's better run it like this I'll do the talking uh, we'll get it we'll get it let her do it it's better it's because she's crying about everything, she's whining about everything, she's drunk and shit. And who goes to their wedding drunk and shit? Well, it's a Sherry. 
that's who. So you do not not shoot this. You gotta shoot it. And so that's why it turned out such a wonderful piece because man, that was close to real as you can get. I mean, goodness gracious. It, the Sherry was just great, great to work with. One heck of a girl and I just loved her like miss her, miss her bad. And many people don't remember this, but uh, you managed the amazing French Canadians in WCW, which of course was the Quebecers, they're better known as the Quebecers. Uh, any memories on that and the way that they were used in WCW, which was pretty poorly? They, they didn't think they were used well, but I'll tell you something that was happening then. Uh, they were, they were not uh, using any finishes where there were disqualifications, run-ins, things. They wanted a winner every night. And if you watch Vince's program today, you see they pretty much give you winners. Uh, and they avoid all that other stuff. At that time, they were doing that. So uh, those boys had a real good contract. They, uh, they were making money. And, um, and so was I. And, uh, and I, I, I saw two guys that were, wanted to be used better. Uh, but sometimes, you know, when you're making real good money and you think you wait on that opportunity to be used better. And so I spoke to those guys about it. Uh, uh, again, I use my old timer stuff. Hey boys, now you ain't listen so much. And uh, uh, probably the final night that we did business, I just loved Jock Ruggio. He's a, he's a close friend of mine. I used him in uh, my territory as a young boy when uh, it was he was finding it hard to get work and get along with guys that I thought he was great. And I used him and I treated him well. And I got my guys to treat him well. And so I had a background with Jock. But uh, Jock wanted to go talk to him, and we were in Chicago about a finish uh, that they wanted him to put the, the Harlem Heat over in the middle again, and Jock wasn't going to do it. And so I, I took him up in the top of the, uh, uh, what's the big building there, the basketball building? There. Huge. They had a big center. Oh, United Center. United Center. We're up in the top of there. And I, and I set him down, and I said, listen, Jock, you do not talk to the office tonight. This, this is a lot going on. I know. And I said, you don't go talk. You don't talk to the office. And yeah, well, I'm not happy. What's it? It's not. A, it's not the night. Tonight's not the night. Don't do it. So, and so Pierre's there, and he says, no, don't. And Jock, listen to him. Listen to him. So I make Jock promise me that you won't go talk to the office. We'll just do this. We're going to do it. Tonight's important. We're going to do it. United Center sold out house. Don't mess with this. And uh, so uh, later on in the evening, um, uh, I, I see Pierre. I say, where's Jock? And he says, I don't know. I said, I haven't seen him in a while. Where is he? Gone. So, oh. He's in the room with the hierarchy, talking to him. Uh, Two weeks later, we all get our notice. And I was in WCW for seven years. Now, I could have been with somebody else. And, and you know, but I had a good run. Seven years is good, a long time, but, but you know, and I had I jock at my home the other day. He's, he's a dear friend and he knows. And, uh, you know, after it was all over, I, uh, I, I, gave, him, I gave him a call. And I didn't run him over the grill for it. I just said, well, you know what? It happened and now it ain't happening no more. And he was like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just wouldn't listen. And I said, no, you didn't listen. And uh, here we are. I got a real long notice <laughs> because I had a lot of background there. They got a real short one. So yeah, it wasn't it, even a year, was it? They were supposed to be there for no. three years, I think. No, they were. They, yeah, they had three-year contract, chance to put away some serious money, and but some people 
And you know what, I go, to, I had Jock, like I said uh, last week, I had Jock as a visitor at my home. We sat and talked, and, uh, and Jock sees it. He absolutely sees it. He says, oh gosh, dog, man, son of a gun. We say, well, we look back on it. Ah, those were the days. And you just pass it on up. There's no hard feelings about anything that uh, I look at that kid today and say he's a full grown man and smart as a whip. And so uh, I don't criticize one ounce. And unfortunately for them, they ended up returning to WWE and they weren't used any better there. And I don't think they even lasted very long there either, unfortunately. But it seems like uh, Jacques ended up doing well on his own after that with his own company and school. And Pierre is now just got signed by Ring of Honor and he was in MLW. And what a guy. Yeah. And what a guy. What a guy, something. Pierre. He's a great guy. Too. He's a, <laughs> yeah, he's a great guy. I'll tell you what, I've, I've, uh, I've run across a lot of guys as Colonel Parker, let alone all the years of, of running my own business. And, uh, and, and get, you know, if, if I told, if I just went down through the line to tell you how many guys, I gave them the names, how many of them got their name, but honky tonk, Wayne Ferris, he's working for me and I look at him, I say, you look like Elvis Presley, you got the sideburns, all the thing, I said, get a jumpsuit, get a guitar, he said, I don't play the guitar, I said, you don't have to, I said, get a guitar, get me a jumpsuit. You're going in the ring, honky tonk man. Honky tonk. All you can do is just stand there and I'll play the friggin' music. And you'll be okay. It saved him because he worked for Vince, and when he got ready to leave Vince, Vince says, I own honky tonk, you can never use it. And he said, Oh no, Robert Fuller's the one that gave me that name. And he had it on a poster from Buffalo. So when they went to do the Sioux job, he did that. Here it is. I got honky tonk in, in uh, Pensacola, Florida, and a lot of guys like that. They said, you know, I I I give them a name. They come in and say, ah, that doesn't work. Try this out. And uh, when when Hogan left, he was he was Terry the Hulk Boulder for us. And when I heard they called him Hulk Hogan, I went, what in the world? What what are they doing to that boy? What a stinky name. <laughs> Wrong again, Rob. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> and to get in your time in WWE, I guess uh, there must have been some contact shortly after your WCW release. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, you mean, how did I get in there? Yeah. Uh, that, that was uh, uh, that Jeff had written some stuff in about being the greatest performer, greatest dancer, greatest wrestler, all that stuff. So he wanted the greatest manager. Uh, so they wanted to bring me in uh, and then Vince gave me the Tennessee League because they want to own them. They want to own that. So I wore some of my stuff from Colonel Parker. Not the white suit, but some of the stuff. And then I wore other stuff here. You see, see here, I've got my uh, 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 Davy Crockett jacket on with me and Jeff in the picture here. Yeah. That was from that. That was from uh, from from uh, WWF. But uh, but when I got ready to leave there, uh, they they wanted to take all likeness, all stuff, you know. So they wanted to they wanted to own my Colonel Parker without owning it. You see, because I had made the mistake, I had worn some stuff and I had done things that. Uh, look like Colonel Parker to work for them, right? And so, yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, I had some ins and outs with them about it till they uh, sent me a contract that said it, it, it got rid of all that likeness, all that thing, all that stuff, so that I could uh, go on being Colonel Parker. Was Tennessee Lee your name that you came up with, or did they give that? That, that was that was Vince, okay. and I loved it. I heard Tennessee Lee, I said, man, I'm off to the races. Yeah. <laughs> that's right, that's just right down my alley. Tennessee Lee, goodness gracious. I'm proud of a name like that. And how was it being on the road like that? Because I guess in WCW, they didn't do as many house shows as WWE. No, no, and it was hard. 
and you know I hadn't wet my feet on catching an airplane every single day heading someplace being lost all the time uh, that about three months into that I'm looking at myself going you know something I might be a little worn and tattered and old for this business because <laughs> uh, I was dragging around pretty bad but but I love the work I love working with Jeff uh, I love the work and I darn sure love the money and I've never never worked anywhere to carry home the money that you do working for Vince and uh, that was probably one of their top time periods too when Austin was on top with the rock oh it was there. great it was great I couldn't believe it I couldn't believe it I worked for WCW I had a contract and they paid my contract and it was a decent contract so I'm a happy camper uh, I go to work for Vince and they got a contract then they pay you per show, then they pay you per pay-per-view, then they send you the royalties. And I go home, I got four checks in the mail. I say, you know what? When Austin said, I think I'm going to New York, and I went, oh, don't burn your bridges, what a goof. <laughs> that I was, uh, I was riding high with, w with WWF, and uh, I'm proud I got a chance to work there. I'm proud I got a chance to work with Vince incredible guy and uh, yeah just life's good man and I heard they wanted to give you an office job at the end of your run yes. there uh, why did you turn that down yes yes I, I had a, a I had a, a real funny conversation with I was in the garden and and uh, had a match with a Blackwell and Jeff worked I thought they had a great match and uh, and Lanza came in and he said the worst friggin' match he'd ever seen in his life. And it really, really gave Jeff a serious cussing. Night. I didn't agree. Uh, right before that, Vince had caught me out in the hallway and he had said, Hey, he said, I, I'm going to bring you up to the office and uh, pick your brain some. So, I'm tired. I'm, I'm tired of the road. I'm tired of the whole deal. But so I look at him and I say, uh, and I say, uh, well, I say, uh, I'm very busy right now. <laughs> I know he's thinking you're freaking busy because I'm hiring you. But I'm saying, no, 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 I'm a very busy guy right now. And I said, uh, you know, when uh, I got a week off or a few, few days off, fly me up and we'll throw some ideas around. And he just looked at me like, you don't understand what I'm telling you, <laughs> you know. And uh, he says, I, I, I'm interested in bringing you in, into the office. And I say, uh, Vince, I don't do computers. You know, I, I, I said, I don't, I don't even email. I don't, I don't text. I don't email. I, don't, I got a telephone. It only calls. I said, I don't do it. He said, we'll, we'll get you a laptop. And I looked at him, classic, and I said, I already have a guitar. <laughs> God, I don't, I don't, he's got, <laughs> flat top, oh, laptop, oh, I got it all wrong. We had the shittiest conversation anybody ever had about going into an office, and so, then they cussed Jeff out that night and the whole deal. Then they were going to get rid of Jeff and all of this happening. And, and so they tell me a couple weeks later we're in San Diego and they say, oh, you're going to do a deal tonight and you're done with Jeff. And, and Jerry Briscoe says, hey, buddy, you're in the office. And I said, what? You know, office? He said, yeah, Vince talked to you. I said, no, <laughs> that conversation was actually I'm going to the office. Yeah. Where's Vince? <laughs> so <laughs> I went to Vince and and I, I, I there he is and I say, hey Vince, I said, uh, uh, I ask you how you guys do business. I said, you know, I'm, I'm managing the guy. I got bookings all over. Uh, I come to one town. 
and they find out in here they're going to hurt me, the thing, I'm out, and, uh, and I'm going to the office. I said, is that the way you guys do business in here? And Vince says, yep. <laughs> yeah. And I say, well, it sucks. I said, you know, I've heard guys that have a better opportunity to know where they're going and going and going and think, oh, it's a great opportunity. I said, sucks. Out I went. And then they called me. Bruce called me. And, uh, and they called me and called me and called me. Paid me for a long time. And they just said, go home, relax a little bit, think about it. And you know, then they give me three weeks and then they call me and I say, no, 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 I don't think I'm going to do that. Till finally they realized I ain't going to do it. I said, you know, I'm too, too, too old, too worn, too tattered. I can't do it. That I'm just not up to it, boys. And they finally figured it out and they called me and gave me a notice. And I've been a happy man ever since. <laughs> So I guess by that time you wanted a break and you didn't try and reach That's out to it. WCW after that. That's it. That's it. That, that, that didn't want, I didn't want any more work. And then, you know, then you get the autograph shows and you get the, the reunions and you get the legends conventions and you get the things that I, and I go and I love it. I love it. And I do one or two. Mm, I'll do three. I'm working hard, and life is really, really good. And uh, and I hate to say, you know, I pretty much had enough. But I think we all get to a point where we realize that I just can't contribute what you're asking for, and I'm not going to come in and fake it. That uh, you know, I'm not going to come in and say, ah, yeah, I'll do this for you, and then walk around without a thought in my mind to help you that uh, if I'm not able to fire you up, sell out your house, give you a bunch of ideas that you go, hey, hibby jibby, man, that's good. That if I can't do that, then I'm going to sit at the house, watch grass grow. And that's pretty much what I'm doing now. And you did make one appearance for Impact in 2006. Uh, what was that all about? I uh, made uh, one deal that, that uh, Bobby Heenan and Sherry and myself went over. They wanted us to do a thing. We're biting for Bobby Roode. We're going to, one of us is going to wind up with him. So I'm talking to him in a limousine and Sherry's talking to him in a fancy hotel room. We're, and each one of us are trying to buy him. We're trying to get him on board with us. And I did, did a deal with them, but we knew they were going to bring one of their girls out of the crew and so they just paid us a whole lot of money to come over and act like we were doing something with Bobby Roode and so that was my in and out of that and you know what anybody that wanted to do that they say hey I got this deal it's kind of interesting you come you play this part for me and I'm gonna pay you a lot of money for it guys let the word get out I'm still doing it <laughs> <laughs> How can people contact you about uh, about bookings now that you bring that up? Uh, quite a few, quite a few, and and uh, I'll be honest with you, I put my price too high, and and then I don't get them. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> but uh, but but now, and I won't say that because sometimes I do get them. Yeah. And how did you end up in uh, MLW? Uh, the boys, the uh, the Dirty Blondes, those kids, they live around here. I worked with them in Dothan, Alabama at a reunion show. I just fell in love with those guys. They're the nicest. They, that, I'm telling you, they got hearts big as a football, both of them. And they ca they called me. They said, Rob, if you do this with, uh, with us, we'll pick you up at your front door. We'll buy you beer. We'll haul you to the thing. We'll bring you back, set you down in your dadgum easy chair when it's all over. You'll never drive a lick. You'll never do a thing. A thing. So when I talk to Court Ballard, the main man in court, tells me, uh, hey, the boys, they love you. They're going to take care of you. They're all in. We quiver over the money and uh, and I say well you know what it's one day a week a month 
one day a month to do tapings for you guys. Now I go for two because I do production for them one day and then the other day and I don't make a whole ton of money and I let myself down on that deal of saying, hey, I'm on, you're going to pay me. I don't really do that with them an awful lot, uh, but I tell you what, I really enjoy the company. Uh, it's a lot of people from WCW, a lot of people I work with in WWF. Uh, uh, Court himself is a great guy. And uh, there's a lot of good guys. There are agents there and their stuff. And uh, to be honest with you, I have a ton of fun with it. And uh, when I get to where I don't, I won't be doing it no more. Who's booking MLW now? It's hard to keep up with it. It is. You know, it was Bruce. When Bruce was there, uh, I was a happy camper. I really think a lot of Bruce. He, um, and Tommy worked for us for years and years, his brother, and I, I just really have real high regard for him. And I'm not sure who's doing the booking there, to be honest with you. I just, they come around, and the last time I was there, they had this beautiful story with this beautiful little gal who's in her early 20s, and she's smitten by the colonel, and, and she's uh, and she's going to wind up being a gold digger and take all my money and and I'm falling in love with her because what in the world am I going to do with a, a girl in her early 20s and it was the greatest storylines and I enjoyed doing it so much but I haven't seen one piece of it on their TV yet so I'm hoping to see some of that and if I don't then I'll realize well they're just shooting a whole bunch of stuff with me and I don't know if it's going to get there or not. And I'm going to ask you a couple of live fan questions as we wrap this up. Someone asks if you still talk to Double J. Yes. Yeah, every chance I get. Every chance I get. I, if I go to an autograph show or a legend show and I'm in the bar and I bump into that kid and it makes my night. I'm telling you, man, I just, you I see him, it's that grin, he's got that grin, he got just, just, just like family. I just love that boy. And is there any common booking mistake you've seen promoters make over the years uh, that's something that a booker today could uh, take as advice? Uh, I don't know, you know, that's a, I, I, I don't know, uh, I give advice as a booker, bookers ought to have the most fun of anybody in all the world, I mean, they develop uh, characters, and uh, they, they set people's lives afire, and when they hit it right, Somebody just gets glorified in life, uh, makes a ton of money. That it's the greatest job in all the world if you're winning, if you're getting it done. But I tell you what, my advice to any booker would be: uh, love your crew, really, really care for your crew. You get a good crew, guys that work with you. They get what you want done done. They, they're, they're your backbone. They're what makes you work. And that, that you, uh, you got to love your crew. You got to go all out for them, man. I've quit places because of money. Because I've said, hey, uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to treat my crew good, and you're not going to screw my crew over, because they're my backbone. They're my brothers, and we stand together. And that, uh, and I've always said, man. I have guys that followed me from place to place to place to place and we are dear friends like brothers and man I would never let them have one day of bad luck if I could keep them from doing it because uh, they're what makes me tick. Someone's asking if you could give your thoughts on Burkhouse Brown who just passed. Great, great guy. Great, a dear friend. Dear friend, great guy. Boy, me and we did that old stuff back in the day of uh, couldn't get away with it today where I put him into my stable and then treated him bad because he was black. And Brickhouse, gosh, dog, he, he saw what we were doing, that I was trying to build a black guy 
that could sell the house out every time he walked through the door. And Brickhouse saw it. And in order to do that, you got to get people's hearts connected with your heart. And you got to give up an awful lot of things before you can achieve that. And the Brickhouse was a friend of mine who said, lay it on me, baby, because I, I know that what you're telling me is right. That, that when this is all said and done, and you achieve with my character what you want to achieve, I'm going to be rolling in the dough. And that I, I loved him for that. I sure did. He was a great friend of mine. Somebody says, what are your thoughts on George Goulas, the guy who killed wrestling in my town, Chattanooga, Tennessee? George Goulas? Yeah. Oh, man, I feel sorry for him. Uh, I, I do. I, you know, he, he, he was a, his father was in the business just like mine. But he didn't have the background nor the ability to do what his daddy wanted him to do and what he wanted to do. But he had the heart for it. He wanted to. But sometimes you just can't. And, uh, and so I, I, anything I'd have to say, I'd say I feel sorry for him. What stud stable run was your uh, most popular stud stable run? Uh, pro probably Memphis. The Memphis thing had a bunch of great guys, and uh, and, and Brickhouse was a great part of that. That uh, that uh, we all we we weren't just a stud stable type of thing. We all ran together and drank together and sat by the pool together and told jokes and rode in the car together. We were buddies. Someone's asking, what's the worst bump you ever took? Goodness gracious. I don't know. Man, I used to like to think that I could, uh, uh, that uh, back in the Jerry Lawler days, back in the early 70s, me and Lawler working together, that you could backdrop me over the top. I didn't touch anything. Uh, uh, stuff like that. And it's a wonder I'm not hurt worse than I am today. Uh, I have problems today, uh, neck, particularly knees, ankles, elbows, and shoulders, and all that stuff you have, but the trouble with my neck and stuff, because I believed for years and years that I could jump off a six-story building and uh, not only survive, but get up and walk away. And uh, that comes back to get you when you're reaching about 70 years old. How heated uh, were things when Jerry Jarrett split from George Goulas? Uh, it was pretty heated, but uh, Jerry's a good man. He's a, he's a good, godly man, and uh, tends to handle things good. Uh, Nick Goulas, I thought a lot of him too. Great promoter. Uh, he, man, he put that fire in you. Come on, boy, get up and fire. When he, he was there, some things he had. wasn't a good payoff man at all. He made Jerry Jarrett look like a, a, a rich guy paying you. <laughs> that, that he wasn't very good with that wallet. He was one of them guys, he'd take out that big wad of money, look you in the eye, and hand you one dollar bills or whatever it is until he saw your face. Oh, he's happy. That's it. Put your wad back up. <laughs> Do you think the Hollywood blondes were split up too soon? Uh, not for me. Not not for me. Boy, I love Pillman. Me and him. Whew. Did we have a heck of a match for that chicken match thing? It's one of the best matches I ever had in my life, and I was in, in well in my fifties. And uh, man, he took me to task. Gosh, dog. Man, we uh, we burned it down. I had all kinds of respect for him. Loved him. And Steve, the same way, but I, but I needed a guy. The, that Sid was gone, I needed a guy. And they had me busting that deal up, and, and, uh, and I, 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 can't, I can't say that I, I even thought about that. I thought, well, it's time that they want to do this, so they're going to do it. So. Someone's asking if you ever worked any matches in Paducah, Kentucky. Not much. Any any Ric Flair stories? Someone's asking. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I've got a lot of Ric Flair stories. Yeah, I've got one Ric Flair story. I'm, uh, I'm, I got my year off. My brother's booking, and I got a year off, and I'm, uh, I'm taking that year, sitting on my butt fishing, and my brother calls me up and he says, "Hey, we need you to work with Rick in Mobile. We we got all the towns booked with everybody." But I say, "Hey." I'm not in shape. I hadn't been working. I hadn't been doing anything. So, no, no, I'll work with him in Mobile. You'd be okay. So I go to work with him, and and, and, I, and I, we're 20 minutes into the match. We've got a 35-minute match, and 20 minutes into the match, uh, I tell Rick, I say, I, I, I'm going to throw up. I'm sick. <laughs> I'm, I'm gassed. I'm done. So I said, so just beat me. And Rick says, no, 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 no. He said, we got another little time to spend. He said, I'll just shoot you in, uh, drop down, and you come back, I'll trip you over. You go out on the floor, vomit, and do your thing, then come back in, we'll finish. Oh, goodness gracious, have mercy on <laughs> me. But that's Rick. That's the way it is with Rick. And then I'm going to go back in, and now we're really going to fire things up. And uh, so, in other words, you know, you're not here to get off easy. We got to give these people a show. And uh, I, I wish I hadn't have done so much fishing. <laughs> and last fan question I'll ask you is: uh, Is AEW going to be another hot shot company that uh, goes under quickly, or do you think it has potential? You know, I, I wish everybody well, I do, but that's a tough question, I really don't know. I, I would say probably not going to work too well, but the uh, way things are today. But and they're signing people to three and four year contracts like Jericho and oh. Cody Rhodes and stuff. That's, that's a lot of Well, uh, it, it, when you start doing that, you pretty well shut your door right there. Yeah. And I wasn't going to allow another fan question, but this is a good one. Any thoughts on Buddy Landell? Buddy Landell. Ah, crazy as a loon. Good buddy. Good friend. Hot dog, man. What a fun time you could have with old buddy. But, uh, whew, what a mess. <laughs> we just interviewed Nobs yesterday. Uh, do you have any stories about the Nasty Boys? Yeah, I got the story of them, uh, how they about killed old Vinny Torelli. You know who Vinny Torelli is? I don't know who Vinny Torelli is. That's, that's, that's Shamrock. Yeah. Oh, yes. I forgot. Of Ken course. Ken Shamrock. Yeah, yeah. Ken, well, he was Vinny Torelli. We were working back in uh, the South Atlantic, uh, living in Charlotte. Everybody's all stor steroided up. It's a bunch of young guys, man. We got Curtis Thompson and, uh, and uh, uh, Chavis, the... The Tonka, the Indian, and they, all these, but and Vinny there, the Shamrock, uh, Vinny, and all these guys are bench pressing 500 pounds, and the just uh, the nasty boys are in there, and me and Matt Bourne sharing a room, and it's just we go to the bars at night. We can't go to many bars because we've been kicked out of every single bar we go to, but we're in one of the bigger bars there one night, and and uh, Vinny's got his girlfriend there with him, and. Now, when I say Vinny now, I mean Ken Shamrock. You people all know him, so I'll go to Shamrock and forget his real name. And uh, Nobbs is there at the bar, and he reaches reach over and he pinches her booby. And, oh, dang boy, Vinny goes crazy about it. But the girl is, a lot of the guys know the girl, so it's not just Vinny's girl. It's just, but, but whatever. But Vinny's going to, he's going to kill Nobbs. He's going after him. And the security comes, and the police, and they get Vinny, and and uh, and, and um, they're holding him. They're going to take him out, but he's he getting at it. So when Nob sees he's got him good, Nob gets his face <laughs> like this in the face, and he like like you do with an orange thing, you know, it's says, yeah. his face like this. Ah, get him out of here. <laughs> Shows him backwards. And when he does, then the other security they get knobs, and they uh, and and so they they they're gonna throw them both out, and they're taking Vinny to jail. I don't know, cause he's fighting. He's he's going crazy. So they take him, and we get Curtis Thompson. We say, you get knobs, get him out of here. We're gonna pay the bill, get everything straightened up, and we'll come out. 
We go out to the car, and the kind of cars are parked together, and Nobbs is down under the car. Curtis Thompson's kicking the shit out of him. <laughs> he's down, he's drunker than hell, and he's down there. So we get in the car and go, go back to the room, and about, well, I guess, three o'clock in the morning, so the, uh, I'm sleeping, and I hear a knock at my door. And I go over and I open up the door and, and it's Shamrock's girlfriend. And I'm thinking, what she want to see the old stud here for, you know? But <laughs> she's a cute girl, you know, and uh, she said, oh, Vinny's gonna kill Nobbs. And I say, what? Anybody, you know, I'm half asleep and here comes, here, here comes Shamrock down the stairs. And he's coming downstairs and he falls and he just boom, 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 boom down the stairs and he comes and he knocks my door open, I'm butt naked. And he runs and shoves me back and he says, where's Nobs? Where's Nobs? And I know, but mm, I don't much want to tell him, you know, but I'm scared not to. <laughs> and I tell him, I uh, need second, third floor, I don't know what room. So he goes up, I'm doing the booking. So I get my pants up and my stuff and I get dressed as fast as I can. I go up the stairs because I know where their room is. They're on the third floor. So I'm going up the, the stairs and I hear. I can hear it way down the hall. Pow, 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 pow. pow. I said, oh gosh, there's a good fight's going on. Well, apparently uh, Shamrock went up and uh, Sags is on the phone with his wife. The big he heavy telephones they used to have in the room. And he's talking to his wife, got a long cord on there. And Nobbs is laying on the bed, passed out. It was all drunk, legs hanging off the back of the bottom of the bed. And, and then he knocks on the door. Sags opens the door and he just shoves Sags out of the way and just jumps on the bed on top of Nobbs and just starts beating the living crap out of him. Now this is what I hear. I'm not seeing this. I'm just hearing it coming down the hallway. You did see that Nobs was passed out earlier. No, 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 no. No, but uh, but the story is Sags hit him with the phone. Back of the head, hit him with the phone, knocked him goofy out on the floor, and then Sags put the boots to him. And uh, by the time I got there, Sags was picking him up, had him waist high, and he was dragging him. He was going to throw him over. Third, three stories, he's going to throw him over. And, uh, and I walk around the corner, I, and, and the door, and, I, and me and Sags, our eyes hit, and Sags just go, drops him. And he goes, oh God, oh God. And I look at Shamrock, and his head is as big as a basketball and you could not recognize him no way and all bloody blood was all over the walls like machine gun massacre the blood was high as the vent there up the wall all, all over the room blood all over everything and uh, knobs laying on the bed legs hanging off from the knees down like it hands like this like you bury a guy yeah. Blood, blood running out of his nose, running out of his mouth. Passed out. Or I don't know if he's passed out or if he's knocked out or what the deal is. But, and I look at Sags and I go, call 911, you know. And I look at Sags and I say, he ain't going to make it. He ain't going to make it. And Sags goes, oh God, oh I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Bad, bad trouble. I already had something going on, and I don't need this, you know. Yeah. So they mentioned that they came there to get away from uh, a different territory where they had heat. They had a problem. They had a sex that I already got a problem. I already got a problem, and he's, he's just like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm saying, get, get, get help for him now, immediately. Police, everybody. Get, get help because, it, you know, I said, I never have seen anything like that. I never seen a guy's head like you can't recognize him fat like that, big like that. His, his brain swelled up or something. I said, he, he ain't gonna make it. So they take him. And, uh, and so 
that's pretty much the story that uh, they wake up the next morning, Sags got his hand in the bucket of water, Nobs goes, yeah, what is the day, yeah, what the hell of a day, you don't even realize nothing happened. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. So why was the police uh, involvement of that? Uh, they came and they took, they, they took Vinny uh, to the hospital. And we all vouch for Sags that he came in, he came to my room, he came in there, he bolted his way in the door, he, uh, he meant to kill knobs, and, the whole, and so nobody got arrested. Okay. Yeah, nobody got arrested. And then just and after that, the boys just went around making sure Shamrock's here, I'm over here, Shamrock's there, I'm over there. <laughs> You don't want to be Shamrock's here. I'm over here. <laughs> you don't want that one. No. <laughs> and they never saw each other again till years later. Right, right. So it had some years to cool off. Yeah. A bit. Although we did interview Shamrock, and I don't think he's fully cooled off about it just yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. And the last question I'll have for you is. Uh, as a wrestling promoter, I just want to know what your best promoting advice would be uh, for wrestling promoters out there. Well, do something that's going to sell out the house. That's the only thing going to keep you in business. <laughs> you gotta do something that's going to sell out your house and know your talent. Uh, know your potential with your talent. I mean, if you're a smart man and, you, and you, you're a good booker and you know what your possibilities are and, and being able to sell out your house and figure out a way to do it. And, uh, that's the whole answer. You get the dollars in your pocket, pay your boys right, moving on up to some better boys and good boys and, and uh, try to make it. And to wrap this interview up, is there any message that you want to say to your fans out there? I just love every one of them. I love to go to these legend shows and these autograph signings and this stuff because uh, I really enjoy bumping into the folks. I'm not one of these guys that, uh, that finds that hard. That uh, I put on the old Colonel Parker tip the hat deal. I, I go to a lot of them with old Buck, Bunkhouse Buck. And, he puts on the bunkhouse buck outfit and tars up his face and gets ugly as smut and, and we still do it the way you ought to do it. We don't go in there two guys that you look over in the corner and say, who is that? That uh, we put on the garb and do the deal because we love it and we love seeing you folks taking pictures with you. And uh, I hope to see every one of you I can before I'm gone. <laughs>